This is the first of a series of MathCasts in which my ultimate goal is to show you a very slick way of simplifying complicated vector products. The material here is not really standard in an engineering mathematics course. and You will need a significant level of endurance to get through it and understand everything. I'm presenting it mainly for enrichment and for interest's sake. There are certain kinds of engineer though who would need to be competent with this material. They include engineers working at the forefront of technology where relativity becomes an issue. Some of this material is also useful in the analysis of stress in materials. So let's get started with the Kronecker Delta. It utilizes the Greek letter little delta, the, little, the small d in Greek. It has two labels attached, usually called I and J. Those labels are nothing other than matrix labels, I referring to the row in delta and J referring to the column. I and J are taken to run over the same range of numbers, in principle 1 to any whole number n. That means of course that delta is a square matrix. In these maths casts I will restrict myself to n equals either 2 or 3. In relativity we would need n equals 4. So let's now give a definition of what the delta ij is. It takes the value 1 if i and j are the same and 0 otherwise. Let's analyze this when n is 2. It means that delta 1 1 is equal to 1. So also is delta 2 2. That's because the i and j are the same in these two deltas. 1 and 1 or 2 and 2. On the other hand, delta 1, 2 and delta 2, 1 must be 0. That's everything for the case when n equals 2. We could now write out the delta in matrix form. Then we see that actually it's nothing other than a fancy way of writing the unit matrix I2 when n equals 2. When n equals 3, the definition gives us the 3 by 3 unit matrix. Just as in the case n equals 2, that's because only the diagonal elements are ones and everything else is a zero. So I hear you saying, why introduce this silly notation when we already know all about matrices? Well, there is an advantage, but you'll have to be patient before you find out. I want to go back to n equals 2, where there will be less writing. I'm going to introduce a vector, v, labelled by its components. In other words, v i, if you like, where i runs from 1 to 2. We could write it this way. Now look at the following construction. It's the sum for j running over all possible values that it could take, that's just 1 and 2 here, of delta ij times vj. Let's write out the sum in detail. It looks like this. Now of course only one of those deltas can be 1 and the other must be 0 because i can only take on one value. It's either 1 or it's 2. If i happens to be 1, then the delta 1, 2 term disappears because of the definition. It's 0. On the other hand, delta 1, 1 is just 1, so we get v1. On the other hand, if i happens to be 2, then it's now the delta 2, 1 term that disappears and that leaves us delta 2, 2 times v2, which is just v2. In both of these cases, the component of v that it singles out is precisely the one labelled by the value of i. When i is 1, we get v1. When i is 2, we get v2. That means we can write the following. Our original sum, delta ij times vj, for j equals 1 to 2, just simplifies to vi. The Kronecker delta has had the effect of summing with the v and replacing the index j with the index i instead. Of course, all we're really doing here is multiplying v by a unit matrix, so it's not surprising that we get v again. After all, i times v is v. So, once again, nothing really new here, but just a rather strange way of looking at things. Bear with me though, it is going to bear fruit. Let me now do a similar exercise, but this time with delta multiplied by another 2 by 2 matrix that I'll call A. A 2 by 2 matrix, of course, has two labels, one for the row and one for the column. 
I'm summing the column index of the delta with the row index of A. If you think about it, what I'm really doing there is just matrix multiplication of each row times each column. Let's see what we get. There are just two terms, one for each of the possible values of J. Once again we can ask what happens if I is 1, what happens if I is uh, 2. It's very much like before. One of the deltas is 0 and the other is 1. We end up with A1K. What about when I is 2? This time we get A2K. Once again, whatever was the value of I is exactly the value that ends up on the row position for the matrix A. When I is 1, we get A1K. When I is 2, we get A2K. So we can now write down what our sum equals in general. It equals AIK. What we've discovered here is a rather fancy way of doing matrix multiplication. Once again, the delta here has had the effect of changing the J on the A into an I. The summed index J gets replaced with the index that is not summed on the delta. The result here again shouldn't be a surprise because after all I2 times the matrix A is the matrix A again. But what we've discovered here is a way of actually writing out the matrix multiplication in terms of the components. Rather like this. I've called it I2 here but it's the same as delta of course. This expression of matrix multiplication works for any matrices that you might want to multiply together. Let's say A and B. The I kth component of AB is the sum for J equals 1 to 2 of AIJBJK. The repeated index J is always summed over and never appears in the final answer. The final answer is AB I kth component with no J's anywhere in sight. I want to finish by exploring some properties of delta a bit further. One important property that we've discovered is that if we sum the delta using a summation over one of its indices with a repeated index on another object, it has the effect of replacing the index with the non-repeated index on the delta. That sounds confusing. Let's just write it out again. Here the J on the V has been replaced with the spare index I on the delta. Notice that I've now included 1 to n in the sum. Everything I've said up to now is true not just for 2 by 2 matrix delta, but for n by n cases with, in this case, v an n-dimensional vector. Let me do something else with the delta now. Consider the following expression. I'll go back to the case n equals 2 again. Let's write out the value of this sum. It comes to 2 because delta 1, 1 and delta 2, 2 are both equal to 1. In the n-dimensional case, the sum of delta i i would come to n. We have a name for this property of a matrix. It's the sum down the diagonals of the matrix, of course. It's called the trace, abbreviated TR. In general, we can write the trace of a matrix A as the sum of the elements A, I, I. Again, this result works for n-dimensional square matrices not just two-dimensional. I've almost finished. There's just one more result I want to get for the delta. In future maths casts I will mainly be working in three dimensions, so I'm going to derive this result in three dimensions. But there will be analogous results in other dimensions as well. This one's a double sum. Let's write out what we get when we expand just one of the sums. Let's take the J one, leaving the I one intact. There, I've expanded using the j-index. If we now expand the sum for the i-index, in principle we will get nine terms. But if you think about it, six of them will have to be zero because they'll contain things like delta 2, 1 or delta 1, 3 that are zero. In fact, the only three terms that survive will be the ones with delta 1, 1 squared, delta 2, 2 squared and delta 3, 3 squared. But remember, each of those deltas is just 1, so this gives us the result 3. It shouldn't be too hard to see that if we used n dimensions, we would get the result n. Is this a surprise? No, not really. Think of it this way. 
Delta is a symmetric matrix. It doesn't matter if we swap the indices. Delta IJ is equal to delta JI. That's because it only has diagonal terms, of course. So if I do that swap in the sum... Oh, and by the way, that should have been a double sum. I left that second one out there for a moment. I've put it in now. OK, let's use that symmetric result in the double sum. So in the second term, I've swapped the IJ and made it JI. But now we have, in the first matrix delta, a column index J, summing with, in the second, index, the second matrix delta, a row index J. That's just matrix multiplication. We learned that before. So performing that matrix multiplication gives us the matrix delta times delta I I. But delta is a unit matrix, so delta times delta is also a unit matrix. And summing over the diagonal elements only, as we are here, delta I I, gives us the trace of the unit matrix. That's just n lots of 1, and so it has to be the result n. I think that's enough material to digest in this first maths cast. I hope I've inspired you to look further at parts 2, 3 and so on. I'll stop here.